solidarity with Ukraine. Enough violence, enough pain. Solidarity with Ukraine. Enough violence, enough pain. Solidarity with Ukraine. Enough violence, enough pain. No war, no warming. Another world is possible. No war, no warming. Another world is possible. Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you all today. I'm so happy to be in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia in this time when our government and the government of Russia are conspiring with governments around Europe to bring about the greatest bloodbath that possibly we've seen in the, on that continent for decades and possibly extended around the world depending on how far they get away with what they want to do. I'm happy to be with you here at a time when people in Russia are demonstrating in unprecedented numbers. I know there's a lot of students of movements against war here, and I'd like to ask you afterwards if you could tell me of a time when people have demonstrated against a war, not before it began, not after there were major casualties, but right after it began. Because I cannot think of an example like this in the history of the world. When the Iraq war began, before it began, there were mass demonstrations in this country. After it began, right after it began, there was almost nothing. And it took years of casualties and atrocities to build up before the movement got its feet again. The Vietnam War took many years before the movement reached the level that it has reached in Russia. Beginning before World War I began, there were demonstrations across the world, and as soon as the cannons began to fire, people left the streets. That is not what we are seeing in Russia today, and it gives me a kind of hope that I cannot describe to you. Despite the killing, despite the atrocities, despite the severe danger that we are seeing every day from nuclear power plants being fired upon, to threats of nuclear war, to troops amassing around the Ukrainian border, but ordered over by NATO. We are seeing a kind of mobilization and a kind of audacity from the people in that region that I have not seen in my lifetime. Over a million people demonstrating in Russia, thousands being arrested and imprisoned. Ukrainians defending their their country and their selves with their lives against all odds. And that poses a challenge to us. That poses a challenge to us because we need to build a movement here that can match that kind of audacity that is growing over there. Because our government, as we know, is capable of incredible crimes, is, inc is incapable of doing things that may seem absolutely insane to you and me. It's the only government in the world that has dropped nuclear bombs on civilian towns. You and I have lived through a war in Iraq that killed over a million people, a war in Afghanistan that killed tens, hundreds of thousands, and countless other operations around the world that have immiserated peoples from one country to another for the sake of profit, for the sake of extraction of resources, and that is exactly what our government views to be at stake in Europe and Ukraine. Both the American government and the Russian government are fighting no holds barred to get control over resources and territory, to get just a little bit of an edge in the fight for economic dominance, for resource dominance, to get the very natural resources out of the ground that threaten to destroy human civilization on planet Earth. But again, I want to say that I come here with hope. I'll tell you, the last time I can think of when Russians mobilized in the streets like this against war, they, threw, they overthrew an entire social order. And if you think that memory is not alive in Russia today, I suggest you read Putin's speech on February 21st, where he says that the existence of the Ukraine owes itself to that very struggle. And that is what he wants to bury. In that struggle, 
which began just two days from today, 105 years ago on International Women's Day. The people of that region made a leap from the darkness of czarism and absolutism into a glimpse of the future. In a country where beating one's wife was legal, women won the right to abortion and took, and took seats in the state while women in the United States still couldn't vote. Oppressed nationalities won all kinds of rights and freedoms. And again, even seats in the government. Around the world today, the memory of that struggle still lives and is being turned back everywhere, or is being threatened everywhere by the governments of the world. They're trying to turn back rights to abortion. They're trying to turn back the rights that people have won. They're trying to cut off the land in Ukraine and sell it off to the highest bidder. And so this fight is a fight on all fronts. Uh, it has meaning for every single struggle and question in our lives. And I think we should take it that seriously, including the destruction of the ecosystem. So, uh, before I introduce our speakers, I want to give a note about safety. Today we are here for a political purpose. We're here to get, make a message known. We want this message to be understood far and wide. But for that reason, our focus is on the message. We're here peacefully. We all want to be safe. We want to keep everyone else safe. If someone comes over here trying to rile people up, make a disturbance, our job is to not let them get the spotlight. That person might like to have their picture on the newspaper and make our entire organizing effort about them. We want to deprive them of that. So we're going to ignore them. We're going to, if they start yelling at us, we're going to start chanting together with that, about our message, not towards them. We're going to keep our eyes on the prize here. If a police officer comes up and starts trying to ask you questions, tell them to talk to one of our marshals. They got a yellow armbands. They're the ones who are organizing the demonstration here. Any police wants to talk to somebody, they can talk to them. If anyone, and also if anyone you think is trying to make some kind of disruption, go to one of the marshals. They're going to help us keep ourselves safe. It's looking so good so far today. All right, before I introduce the speaker, let's have some chance here. Russia out of Ukraine! 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 No war in 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 Ukraine! Money for jobs and education, not for bombs and occupation! Money for jobs and education, not for bombs and occupation! Money for jobs and education, not for bombs and occupation! Money for jobs and education, not for bombs and occupation! No war in Ukraine! No war in Ukraine! No war in Ukraine! No war in Ukraine! Stop Russian rocket fire and the U.S. Empire! <laughs> Stop Russian rocket fire and U.S. Empire! 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 All right, thank you very much, everybody. Let's begin with Mr. Stan Heller from Promoting Enduring Peace. He's been working on this kind of fight for a long time. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. How do we ordinary people react in a world where rival imperial powers are at each other's throats, where they openly invade or wage cyber warfare? How do we act when the one empire gets on its high horse to condemn a rival's horrible misdeeds while hiding its own immense hypocrisy? How do we act when not just millions of lives are at stake, but when military emissions may doom all hope of a livable climate? 
when the when the loser in direct U.S. warfare, when the loser in direct U.S. Russia warfare would be tempted to use nuclear weapons. Let's be straight. The main thing going on in Eastern Europe is that an imperial country is invading a small country so it can conquer it. We have to show absolute solidarity with the Ukrainian people who are being ravaged by a thuggish regime who is angered that a rival is getting closer to his border, but whose main concern is restoring an, um, an empire to its supposed glory under the czars. We have to show solidarity and express awe at the resistance being shown by Ukrainians, but we cannot let our sympathy mean support for the U.S. empire and its recklessness, recklessness that could escalate to nuclear war. First, we have to condemn. Condemn Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Condemn the rocketing of residential buildings and schools and hospitals. Condemn, act, condemn attacks on the nuclear power complex. Condemn a groveling parliament that voted unanimously to make any mention that Russia is at war a criminal offense. Condemn the 8,000 arrests of Russians opposed to the war and condemn the Biden administration for its lack of aid to Syrians suffering under the same Russian bombs that kill Ukrainians. Second, we have to oppose hypocrisy. From what you hear from the Biden administration, you'd think the government was a paragon of virtue. No mention is made of the million Iraqis this government killed by sanctions and war or the hundreds of thousands of children in Afghanistan who may be perishing right now because the U.S. left that country a basket case, or the silence about the ongoing Saudi-U.S. war of aggression against Yemeni. The media glories the Ukrainians making all the tough cocktails, but when a 14-year-old Palestinian kid named one, the Israelis shot him dead in our corporate media buried the story. Third, we have to be honest. We can't be blind to the defects of the current Ukrainian government. It is not a perfect victim. For years, it allowed a neo-Nazi battalion to be a part of its official army. Connecticut senators have lent a blind eye to this fact, and so have U.S. presidents. Putin has been using this to keep the naive and the wavering in line. But we have to realize that neo-Nazis are a problem all over, in France, in the USA, and in Russia, where Putin has treated them with kid gloves and embraces. Finally, fourth, we have to propose courses of action. Here are some ideas cancel the Ukrainian national debt to Western banks, send massive aid to Syria, end our own monstrous collaborations with the Saudi Kingdom in its Yemen war, stop supporting the Israeli apartheid regime, propose measures to keep Ukraine out of the gasp, grasp of any empire, commit to dismantling the never-ending war alliance NATO, start rationing fossil fuel, assist refugees running from Ukraine, whether white citizens, Afghan refugees, or African students. Putin, get out of Ukraine! All power to righteous resistance. A couple chants. Solidarity with Ukraine. Enough violence, enough pain. 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 Superpowers make a stain. 
Russia NATO out of Ukraine. Superpowers make us stay. Russia NATO out of Ukraine. Superpowers make us stay. Russia NATO out of Ukraine. Superpowers make us stay. Russia NATO out of Ukraine. And one last one. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. Please welcome Melinda Chuhus, who's a longtime environmental activist and a member of 350 Connecticut. Hi, everyone. Hello. It's Hello. Good to see you all here. This is such an important thing to be doing. Can't hear you. Put it up your mouth. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just as Putin invaded Ukraine, I happened to be reading the chapter about Ukraine in Simon Winchester's book, Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. The chapter describes how as many as 10 million people died of starvation when it was part of the Soviet Union under Stalin's forced collectivization scheme. That's quite a legacy, and Russia's current ruler seems to want to relive the past. First, we in 350 Connecticut honor all the Russians who have taken to the streets to condemn their own country's actions in Ukraine. 8,000 have already been arrested. We have been working for the past 10 years toward the goal of eliminating coal, oil, and gas production in the U.S. in order to stabilize our climate. The war in Ukraine highlights dirty energy's role in destabilizing our geopolitics. In response to Putin's aggression, Germany stopped certification of one gas pipeline from Russia. But, so, sorry, but Russia still supplies half of Germany's gas and 30% of gas to Europe overall. Oil and gas make up 60% of Russia's exports. Big oil companies like Exxon, BP, and Shell all work with Putin-controlled Rosneft and Gazprom, the Russian state oil and gas companies, respectively. Some of these foreign companies have announced they are pulling out of Russia due to its invasion of Ukraine, but it's unclear how much or for how long. With gas supplies reduced, Germany may have to revert to burning more coal, which is terrible for the climate and also deadly because of its toxic air emissions, or to keeping their nuclear power plants running longer than their stated closure dates. We've seen the barely avoided Armageddon when Russia attacked Europe's largest nuclear power complex in Ukraine this past week. Meanwhile, to solve these problems, U.S. companies and many politicians are calling for even more U.S. production and export of LNG, liquefied natural gas. So-called natural gas is methane, which is 100 times worse for the climate than CO2 over a 10-year time frame. And the climate experts at the International Panel, Intergovernmental, sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, have said that's the time we have left to cut our fossil fuel emissions in half or face true climate catastrophe. Their most recent report just last week emphasized how dire the situation is. But the, but the International Energy Agency, a conservative body established in the wake of the oil crisis of 1973, said last May that to prevent devastating feedback loops, there should be no new fossil fuel projects after 2021. Militaries around the world, with the U.S. far in the lead, consume vast amounts of oil and gas, even in peacetime, and a war greatly increases that consumption, with dire consequences for the world's population and the climate. The U.S. military budget of almost $800 billion 
should be converted to meet human needs. Yeah. Like yeah. building electric heat pumps for Europe and for us here at home. We must do everything in our power to make sure the outcome of this horrible war is not a supercharged fossil fuel future, but instead a renewable energy future that we urgently need to solve the climate crisis and end the pernicious influence of the petro states, including our own. We say, no war, no warming. No, no war, no warming. No war, no warming. No war, no warming. Thank you so much, Melinda. Now we're going to hear from Nika Zarasvat, who's an Iranian activist against war for immigrant rights and for justice in Palestine. Please give a round, a warm round of applause for Nika. Yeah. I'm an Iranian immigrant and organizer, and I'm grateful to have lived in New Haven for almost six years now, where I've had kind of a second political upbringing alongside the intergenerational communities that have organized against racism, war, deportation, occupation, gendered violence, incarceration, police brutality, and the list goes on. It's important for me to note that because if there's anything I've learned as an Iranian in the United States is that the only fighting chance that we have is at the intersection of our struggles against the state's interest to isolate and destroy revolutionary movements. As an immigrant from Iran, I'm used to people not knowing anything about the country I come from besides the talking points of nuclear weapons and sanctions. This is completely intentional. The United States government has tried to isolate Iran through sanctions and propaganda for more than 40 years and sells this strategy to Americans as diplomacy without bloodshed. I want to share with you that people living in Iran have known very well for 40 years that America, what Americans might not understand, given that they have not been sanctioned. Sanctions only empower politicians who antagonize each other on the opposite ends of an endless war. The United States government proudly claims that it's starving the, quote, largest sponsor of terrorism in the world, without American bloodshed, which is what got me the most, and the Iranian government proudly claims that it has only remained steadfast and resilient in the face of unilateral sanctions from the most powerful economy in the world. After, they're both winning. After all the performance and applause of a humane diplomatic approach, people will pay the cost. My own family members were not able to get vaccines PPE and medicine during the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw videos of nurses getting IV treatment for COVID and still treating patients because unlike governments, we refuse to let each other die. Some of my own family members were hospitalized and died because the only vaccines they had access to were not the most effective ones. And they had underlying health conditions too. My family members are interrogated for two hours by their own bank in the United States because they send money to Iranian medical students in Ukraine. European banks refuse to help pharmaceutical companies do business with Iran because their transactions will be monitored and investigated by the CIA. While most Americans can't imagine While well, most Americans can't imagine the impact of sanctions beyond gas prices going up, any Iranian who still speaks to family back home is fluent in the language of sanctions. As a young person, I've only ever known my country as it has been impacted by these sanctions. Any Iranian can tell you what it means, or rather, how it feels to be 
be told that we deserve to be punished for the government's human rights violations and pay the cost ourselves. That's why I'm here speaking about sanctions. Because sanctions do not hurt Putin, who has far more power and protection than the Islamic Republic. Sanctions do not hurt war economies because governments will always find a workaround. I can confidently say that the sanctions have not stopped the Iranian government from sponsoring armed groups in the Middle East and killing our own. What they may not be able to work around is the number of people who are suddenly laid off from the workplace. The growing number of migrant workers who travel from rural areas to Tehran because of the drought and can't find work. The number of businesses that close down because Iranians have no purchasing power. Sanctions have no, can have immediately devastating effects, but in reality, they envision a long game because they're rarely able to stop the war immediately. The vision of sanctions is an endless war of isolation and starvation, but it requires Americans buying into the idea that people in other countries, not safe, should pay the cost of the warfare we're watching on TV. If we can't make Putin pay the way we would like to, the Russian people should have to overthrow their government for us. In a nutshell, that's been the US's strategy in Iran as well. Yet, calls to sanction weapons sales to countries where the United States pays billions of dollars to fund apartheid is seen as activist talk. This is why I'm asking us to think carefully and critically about which sanctions are being imposed and whom they will benefit. Today, 40 years into sanctioning Iran, there are two possible endings in sight. Either the collapse of my homeland, starting with its people, or a people's movement in the United States to end sanctions. Yeah. I stand in solidarity with the people everywhere who deserve to fight for political autonomy and revolution on their own terms, by and for their people. Thank you. Yeah. And all the violences that are done on our bodies and our territories. And during this pandemic, we've only seen these violences intensify. Uh, we've seen how care labor the, the labor of caring for children, of caring for elders, of caring for the sick is called essential, but it's not valued. Sometimes it's not paid at all. And it's extracted from people who are often women, who are often uh, migrants without status, who are often black women and migrant women in this country and around the world. Uh, but this March 8th, women and queer people, LGBTQ people around the world are striking against war. And they're having a global scream against war. Uh, and if you want to join me, we're going to be outside of this courthouse at 9 o'clock a.m. outside of the Connecticut courthouse with a woman who is fighting her domestic violence case. We're going to be at the women's table on Yale campus at noon, and we're going to be at the women's park across from Mescal Restaurant at 5 o'clock p.m. And we're going to join our sisters and our siblings across the world in a global shout to denounce war and to denounce all the violences that are committed and all the oppressions on our bodies and on our territories. Um, for the self-determination of women, for the self-determination of LGBTQ people, um, and for the self-determination of all people who are struggling to free themselves from imperialism and from war. Uh, we have been in touch with feminists from Russia who are also calling on all of us to stand up against war, who are saying that war always leads to more sexual violence, more rape, more violence against women, more poverty, um, more oppression for working people. Working people and working women never win in these wars. Um, so I'm here with all of you today. I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, and Tuesday, let's join together and let's make some noise with our sisters and our siblings all around the world. Um, I'll put it up on the Ulawa page and 
um, long live women who struggle. Que viva las mujeres que luchan. Thank you, Megan. No sanctions, no bombing, no war. We ain't gonna take it. No, that's not gonna work. No sanctions, no bombing, no war. 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 Next up, we have Mitch Link. He is a a veteran of the Iraq War and an anti-war activist and an environmental justice activist. Please give a round of applause for, for Mitch. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mitch Link. I'm a veteran of the Iraq War and I'm happy to stand with you all today against the evasion of Ukraine and for an end to the war machine everywhere. Yeah. The most important thing I learned in my time in the military is that war. Closer to me. Closer to me. Ah. The most important thing I learned in my time in the military is that war, invasion, and occupation serve the needs of the very rich who will sacrifice countless lives for their own profits. Hearing and seeing the destruction that Russian bombs and bullets are bringing to the people of Ukraine is an obvious reminder of what this country has done in Iraq, Afghanistan, and countless other places around the world. My experience as a Marine taught me that the people actually fighting the wars are not motivated by hatred or some innate violence. But rather, like me, they were poor kids looking to secure a better future for themselves and their families through what is often the only option open to them in a very sick society. This fact is a tragic one, but it is also the source of some hope. Because these are the same people, workers, farmers, and members of oppressed groups who are mobilizing against the war, who have no reason to support it. There's already some examples in Ukraine of fraternization between Russian soldiers and Ukrainian workers, and this gives me hope. Soldiers on both sides of the war have connections through family, culture, and history. They have connections not just with each other, but with the heroic anti-war movement developing in Russia under pressure from the state. They have connections with the working class in Kazakhstan and Belarus who have carried out massive upsurges, including general strikes against their own government, plans to privatize the public sector, and against Russian domination of their country. All of this gives me hope. And it also gives an example for us here today. We can see the methods of struggle that we can follow. Mass action, strikes, ways of struggle that involve the people who really make society run. The workers in every industry who make everything that keep people alive. The workers, the small farmers and agricultural workers who produce all the food we eat. When I was in Iraq, I realized I had infinitely more in common with the Iraqis suffering under US occupation, regardless of growing up in different cultures, halfway across the world, speaking different languages, than I did with the handful of super rich people that started the war, that benefited from the destruction of a country, that saw billions in profits from the death of almost one million Iraqi people. What I learned from studying history is that what makes this realization, the realization that those fighting have more in common with those ruling, really meaningful is anti-war movements that can put hundreds of thousands and millions of people into the street. Anti-war movements that give rank and file soldiers the confidence to resist orders, yeah. to disobey officers, to call for the defeat of their own military. That's right. Yes. This is what we need to build. And what that needs is organization. People from different groups and communities coming together to stand against war in Ukraine. People who don't believe the lies that United States or NATO intervention will help the Ukrainian people at all. Who understand that the United States government is the most destructive purveyor of violence this world has ever seen. So I want to end by saying that I'm proud to stand here speaking out against Russian violence. But we know that as long as a few people are running all of society and their interests for their own greed, that war will never end. That environmental destruction will continue. To make the changes that we need for a peaceful world based on cooperation and solidarity, we need to stand together and to build from here. Because great things have happened in the past, and they always start small. So have hope and take action. Thank you. Thank you.
It's my privilege to introduce Dylan Connor, a uh, Latin teacher, a fellow who has uh, gone to the Middle East to help uh, Syrians many times, and who is a uh, well-known singer, a professional singer. He's not going to sing today, but he's going to give us the benefit of his uh, wisdom. Dylan Connor. Yeah. Thank you, Stanley. Hey, everybody, how you doing? It's great to see everyone here together today for a righteous cause. To my right here is my mother-in-law from Syria. She was forced to flee in 2011 when the revolution began in Syria, a revolution for freedom, democracy, self-determination. She took to the streets immediately, went to jail immediately, and then we got her uh, to the United States. So let's give it up for a freedom, yeah. freedom fighter here. Um, I am a, a, a proud uh, activist for a free and democratic Syria, and that's why I'm here today, because many of you probably know that the Syrians have been under daily bombardment from Putin's military machine since 2015. 2015, Russia went in full throttle to support Bashar al-Assad, and the Syrians know all too well the horror of Putin's war crimes. Targeting hospitals, targeting schools, with his fighter jets on a daily basis. You look at the pictures in Ukraine today, you look at the pictures from Syria from 2015, 16, 17 and on, they look the same. You can barely tell the difference. So I am here to say, as a member of the Syrian American Council, a national board member of the Syrian American Council, which is the largest advocacy grassroots organization of its kind, I'm here to say to the Ukrainians, your struggle is our struggle. Your fight is our fight. We are fighting the same enemy, and we must stand in solidarity together. Syrians, Syrian Americans are with you, the Ukrainian people, as you struggle against the same aggressor we face on a daily basis. So, everyone, I want to ask you a question. I've really loved a lot of what I've heard here today, but I have a question I don't have the answer to, and I want you to think about it. We, in the anti-war community, what will we think? What will we say to each other if Putin progresses to simply obliterate Ukraine? If he succeeds, it continues and bombs it into rubble, killing thousands upon thousands of people who want help. Imagine if you were under bombardment, the first thing you would think is, I need help. Who's going to protect me? That's my question for you. Who is going to protect these people? Are we okay to stand by and let them be obliterated? Simply, and we can rally. But we're lucky to be able to rally here and speak freely and gather without fear of violence. So that's my question to you because the Syrian people have been asking that question for years. Who's going to help us? And they have been abandoned. And I only hope that the Ukrainians are not abandoned. So thank you so much for letting me be here today. Thank you so much for letting me express the solidarity of the Syrian people who've suffered under Putin with the Ukrainian people suffering under Putin. May we stand together and may we Conquer, may we, no, conquer is the wrong word. <laughs> yeah, definitely the wrong word. May we succeed, may we all succeed in driving out Putin and his military machine from Ukraine and from Syria. Thank you all so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. No sanctions. No bombing. No war. 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 Next, I'd like to invite up Eric Goodman from Socialist Revolution. Whoever he may be. Eric, you here? Yeah, I'm right here. I thought I was after Black Lives Matter. Oh, uh, they did it pulled out. Okay. Who thinks that we need a revolution against capitalism? Woo! Woo! War was baked into capitalism from the beginning. Capitalism came into this world dripping head to toe and from every pore with blood. It was baptized with the blood of Catholics and Protestants. Muslims, Africans, and the indigenous peoples of the New World. Today, it demands the blood of the Ukrainian people and of Russian conscripts. War is unavoidable under capitalism because profits must always be expanded for capital to survive. In 2022, there is no more land for capital to conquer, no new workers and slaves for it to exploit, and shrinking resources for it to steal while the world burns. All that is left for the ruling class to do is to fight over the division of the spoils. Their profit system is in terminal decay, and their backs are against the wall. The financial house of cards the bankers have built is close to collapse, and debt is now three times almost global GDP. The U.S. empire has been the key pillar of global capitalism for a hundred years. But American rule has been seriously shaken by the defeats in Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Ukraine. In every country around the world, people are looking for a way out of this crisis. They are relearning old traditions of mass mobilization and militant strike action. The working class has never been larger or better connected, nor has any single cog ever been more vital to a complex global supply chain. This is why the ruling class tries so hard to divide us. The bourgeoisie has no more deadly poison than that of nationalism. In America, nationalism was used to justify genocidal manifest destiny, and it serves as a screen for our aggressive militarism. No matter the conflict, the main enemy under capitalism is always at home. Sorry. In Maidan, Ukraine, it is used to justify the persecution of Russians, Jews, Roma, and gays. In Russia, Putin calls on the dark legacy of Tsarism to prosecute his war. The comrades of the Russian section of the IMT are out fighting alongside the workers and youth of their country against Russian chauvinism and the war. Their slogan, just like ours, is no war between people and no peace between the classes. The only antidote to nationalism is working class internationalism. As Engels said, because the conditions of the workers of all countries is the same, because their interests are the same, their enemies the same, they must also fight together. They must oppose the brotherhood of the bourgeoisie of all nations with the brotherhood of the workers of all nations. Around the world, not a box is shipped, a classroom taught, nor a patient nurse, but by the kind say-so of the working class. This is the basis of our strength, and herein lies our ability to change the world. If American dock workers refuse to ship arms to Israel and Saudi Arabia, the occupations in Palestine and the war in Yemen would be over in a week. All right. If Yale facilities, service, and graduate workers unions supported one another and struck with the people of New Haven, Yale could be convinced to part with its $43 billion endowment. <laughs> Friends, comrades, and fellow workers, now is not the time for depression and apathy. The system cannot take us a single step further. Our only option is to fight for a whole new world. The IMT is organizing in over 70 cities across the U.S. and 40 countries around the world to smash this rotten system before it smashes us. If you believe a better world is possible, come to our table, read our paper, and join us in the fight for socialism in our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you.
Central Connecticut Democratic Socialists of America. I think he's here. Yes. Yay. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Men Menace Carly. <laughs> it's okay. And we were almost messed that one up. Comrades, I regret that it isn't more hopeful times than bring us together, but rather that war is again taking human lives. The Central Connecticut DSA condemns the Russian invasion of Ukraine and calls on the United States to use its diplomacy and dialogue as the main instrument to bring peace, to de-escalate and to refrain from imposing any measures that would endanger the prospect of peace. The U.S. must pull it out of NATO and out of Europe and Russia out of Ukraine. It is important now more than ever that these means be employed so that no more of our fellow Ukrainians suffer. We must stand in solidarity not only with the working classes of Ukraine and Russia who did not ask for this war, but all peoples facing similar terrors. We must stand with, the, with the Afghans as we do with Ukraine. The U.S. should give them their money back and help them avert famine. We must stand with Yemen as we do with Ukraine. The U.S. should stop helping Saudi Arabia genocide them. We must stand with Venezuelans, Iranians, and Cubans as we do with Ukraine. The U.S. should lift all sanctions and end the over six decade embargo of Cuba. Yeah. We must stand with the Iraqis as we do with Ukraine. The U.S. should pay war reparations to them. If irredentism is so obviously wrong, if the forceful seizure of a country or foreign territory is illegal, then the U.S. should give Puerto Rico back to Puerto Ricans, Hawaii to Hawaiians, the same with Guam, Samoa, the Mariana Islands, and the Virgin Islands, along with rep reparations for years of nuclear testing, violence, repression, and occupation. The U.S. must follow through on its star-spangled rhetoric and state of values and not denigrate what is left of its reputation, if there's any left. Our solidarity does not compel us to call out what is happening in Ukraine. Our solidarity does not compel us to call out what is happening in Ukraine because it is wrong, but rather that what is happening in Ukraine shouldn't happen to anyone. That is the basis of our solidarity. It is universal or it is nothing. Thank you, right. Thank you Kevin. Please welcome next Alyssa Ray, who is a member of the New Era Young Lords and a worker in the defense industry. Good morning. Today I want to speak as someone who hasn't always been into politics and someone Sorry, how about now? Okay, should I start over? Okay. Good morning. Today I want to speak as someone who hasn't always been into politics and someone who is still learning about the, all the chaos, death and destruction, imperialism and capitalism and wars all over. Wars over land and imaginary borders, money or oil have created. And how we as Americans, for example, aid places like Israel, to continue their genocide of Palestinians. Especially here in CT, where a good percentage of our jobs are in manufacturing for the military industri industrial complex. Which personally makes me nauseous because this is in this capitalistic society, we work in an industry where you feel like you're selling your soul or your kids don't eat. Now, as we all watch in horror at, at what's happening in Ukraine, I unfortunately can't stop comparing the reactions between this current crisis and crises that have been ongoing in black and brown countries. I am obviously saddened and terrified for the citizens of Ukraine, but I'm angry watching the way the media speaks about these refugees as compared to how they speak about, say, the Syrian refugees Europeans recently had no room for. The Prime Minister of Hungary actually said the moral human thing is to make clear, please don't come, while putting up a 13-foot high barbed wire fence over 100 miles of their Serbian border. Whereas of two days ago, I've seen numbers over 100,000 Ukrainians have been let in in days, in days since the Russians invaded Ukraine, without any reservation. Why is that? Now please don't mistake my words for any ill wishes for the people of Ukraine, that's not what this is. I'm just hopeful for the day where, all, where the same energy is used to help all countries, all people, black, brown, and indigenous people, have been murdered and displaced for years all over the world. 
we hear things like, these are not the refugees we're used to. These are Europeans. These are intelligent. They are educated people. That's the Prime Minister of Bulgaria. And we don't even bat an eye. That's sadly normal to hear. It makes people, cr it makes people like us cringe now. But a few years ago, I honestly can't admit that I wouldn't have had a second thought because white supremacy and implicit bias control every narrative, every news source, every law. White supremacy needs to be stamped out for good. We hear things like, these are not the refugees from Syria. These are refugees from Ukraine. They're Christian. They're very similar to us. That was a CBS News anchor. Here's another one. This isn't a place with, like, all due respect, like Iraq or Afghanistan, that has seen conflict raging for decades. This is a relatively European city where you wouldn't expect or hope that this is going to happen. I have to choose those words carefully, too. So they knew what they were saying was racist, and they still chose to say it publicly, on the news for that matter, for anybody with internet access to, for anybody with the internet to have access to, and continue to spread this hateful rhetoric on black and brown people. Also, he must have not been a news anchor back like in 1991 to 2016, because Ukraine went through it to keep their independence. Their, their protests were pretty badass, if I'm, not, if I'm being honest. But again, they're white, so that's allowed and civilized just like our insurrection on January 6th of 2021. And that comparison is only for the whiteness and not the message behind their actions. To end on the only positive note I could, I found an Irish politician of some sort speaking about the same issues we are right now, and they definitely said it better than me. So he said, you are happy to correctly use the strong and robust language to determine crimes against humanity against Putin, but you do not use the same strength of language when it comes to describing Israel's treatment of Palestinians. It continues by talking about the fact that it is documented by multiple entities that what is happening in Palestine, the assault on Gaza, the annexation, annexation of land and territory is a systematic application of apartheid. But yet, Palestinians are told to go and sit and negotiate whether, rather than have the response we see in Ukraine, which should be the response every time. Right. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Next we have Subi Toro, also the New Era Young Lords National Chairman. Come on over, Subi. How's everybody doing? You guys can hear me? Hold it closer. With me. I'm super nervous and I normally don't speak publicly. All right, like I said, bear with me. I normally don't speak publicly, so I'm a little nervous up here. But uh, can I get a fist in the air? For everybody that's in struggle right now, can I get an all power to the people? All power to the people! All power to the people? All power to the people! All right, like I said, bear with me. War is bloodshed. War is politics with bloodshed. Politics is war without bloodshed. War is politics with bloodshed. Politics is war without bloodshed. I heard that on a Fred Hampton interview. And that resonated with me. It resonated with me because the understanding of international struggle is important, especially here and now. We shouldn't have to wait for our brothers and sisters to be invaded, not just in Ukraine. We have Palestine, we have Puerto Rico, and we have other places in struggle. We shouldn't wait to hostile takeovers to be able to come together as people to stand up for one another. There's a lot of things going on in society that individuals and people don't know. And it's time for us as people to start educating and teaching. I've learned a lot today. I, don't, I didn't know a lot about Ukraine. I didn't know a lot about Palestine. But sitting here and listening to everybody on their struggle and what's going on is very important. It's very important for someone like me who doesn't know, but that also comes from somebody that has struggled. The United States has Puerto Rico by the balls, excuse my language, by the balls. We're dealing with the, the Jones Act, we're dealing with Act 22, we're dealing with Act 60. We're dealing with a lot of things right now that's hindering Puerto Rico to build its own economy. We're allowing private investors to come into Puerto Rico to gain profits, capital, not just on personal, but in, in, in business. This is something that needs to be acknowledged. This is something that each one of us has to understand. The struggle of international struggle of people because when one of us struggle, we all struggle. If it happens to Ukraine, what do you think is gonna happen to other places that can't fend for themselves? The same exact thing. So today is the day that we have to start understanding unified struggle. We shouldn't wait till somebody's knocking at the door, wait till somebody's taking over and not help. Today is the day that we have to make the difference. 
We don't need to, to come together at the last minute. So when somebody's saying we have issues in the community, we have to come down here. I was just listening to Sister CJ telling me that she has issues having a crowd come down to her situation. And that doesn't make any sense if we all in the same community. We need to come together. Not when it's something as drastic as this. So I want to leave you guys with that and thank you for bearing with me. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Subi. Can I have a next? Uh, Rosalba, Unidad Latina, and Acción. Nope, okay. <laughs> Can I have next, Briam, an anti-war ve anti veteran and a member of ULA. Unidad Latina, and Acción. Welcome, Briam. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Briam. I'm a, I'm a trans uh, veteran of the United States Army. I'm a veteran and I'm against all forms of war and uh, the advancement of the military machine and aggression. I find that it helps no one but those who profit off it, which are very few, mainly the governments and uh, you know, a few select corporations. Soldiers and everyone else who serves the military machine are seen and treated as interchangeable, disposable parts. Lives are ruined, minds are lost, and people have come home forever changed. It affects families, friends, our entire communities. And I would argue that those who fight in wars are victims of the war also themselves. When can we remember when our government has not been at war? We just got out of one six months ago, and I feel like they're trying to edge towards a possible another one. And I'm not a big fan of that. <laughs> The governments prey upon poor and disenfranchised communities to feed the war machine. Because who else joins? I joined because I couldn't find a job after college. And I thought I could change it from the inside. No, no you cannot change it from the inside. They will push you to the side. You will do the right thing, they will forget about you. They will try to silence you. It took me upwards of four to five years to get health care and benefits I was entitled to after they kicked me out. I, was, I had an honorable discharge. There was no uh, reason as to why. So they're like, what happened? We don't, you don't need benefits. You're, you're fine. I was assaulted by a captain and I said something about it. And people don't like that. And I made sure something happened. But all that happens is he's not an officer anymore. And uh, so we're all lured in by the benefits. Free health care, free education, possible pension. Why is that not available to all citizens? That's right. Why is that not available That's to all right. the people? We wasted trillions of dollars over the, over the course of my lifetime. How many millions of people's lives were destroyed? That's why all war needs to end. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Priam, and Russian Rocket Fire, and U.S. Empire. And U.S. Rocket Fire. Stop Russian Rocket Fire, and U.S. Empire. 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 No war, no warming. Another world is possible. No war, no warming. Another world is possible. No war. No warming, another world is possible. No war, no warming, another world is possible. Hey, hey, ho, oh, ho, all wars have got to go. Hey, hey, ho, oh, ho, all wars have got to go. Hey, hey, ho, oh, ho, all wars have got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho, all wars have got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho, all wars have got to go. Next up, please welcome CJ of Black and Brown United. Hello, fellow liberators. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you, Subi, for raising that point. It would really be nice to see this level of solidarity to end the oldest pandemic and war that is unspoken, and that is racism. You see, I'm not white, I don't know if you knew that. So, when us who are not white and without privilege go outside, the war is automatically on us. Yes. Right here in New Haven, 
The war is on us more than ever. Your friend, Dustin Elliker, rather spend more money on police than on hiring and training black and brown people. The war is present right here in New Haven where we rather let Yale take up all the space and drive the people out. The people who feed you, the undocumented immigrants, the black and brown people, the homeless people, the sex workers, the formerly incarcerated, the everyday targets on the war. Yes. The war happens every day here in New Haven. What should we do? Well, while this is nice, and I appreciate all the information about the Ukraine, I agree with my friend Stanley, the U.S. is not blameless, and quite frankly, neither is New Haven, Connecticut. Not just Connecticut. Ned Lamont, where's the recovery? We need a recovery for all. That's right. We have domestic workers working long hours. They can't even take a break to change themselves if they have their period or anything like that. We have the post-incarcerated coming out with no opportunities, being terrorized behind bars. Tell me where the war is not. Tell me where it is not. I don't know that answer. You know why? I'm not white and I don't have privilege. So I have to gear up. And you know what we call that? Resilience. Right? Our smiles, we wear them because we, we don't know how to feel pain no more. The knee has been in our neck so long. We wear it, we're so used to it. We see it all the time. If you wanna end the war, tell the state of Connecticut to remove the funding so we can have people who really represent the people up there. Speaking on behalf of the people. Tell them to pay real livable wages. All right? Tax Yale. Yes. Tax Yale. Tax Yale. Stop the war on the poor. Stop the war on the poor. Poor people are fed up. We are fed up. We had enough. We are tired. We are hungry. We are living on the corners and the bridges. There's no recovery for us. We come here with dreams and hope and think it will be treated like a human being. But we are detained and harassed by ICE. And when we speak up, we are harassed in front of our office, as happened to my friend John Iro Lugo, and thrown in jail. For what? For speaking for the oppressed. So my friends, I enjoy you being here, and I love the solidarity. But if you want to be an ally, remember, when we wake up, when we wake up, we are already at war. Our friend Malcolm told us, who taught us how to to, help, to hit ourselves said that. Fidel told us a revolution is not a bed of roses. And Tupac said we have money for war but we can't pay the poor. Who pays for war? The people we are not talking about. The oppressed people. The person sleeping on a bench right now. The domestic worker whose back hurts. The women, girls, and trans people who gotta get access to period supplies. That's who suffers, and the many more, the voiceless. So let's not show up only once or twice when it's trending. Let's act like we know it. We want to end this war? Let's stand up for the oppressed. And let's act like we mean it. Yes. The people united will never be defeated. 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 Please stay tuned to the Black and Brown United in Action at Unidad Latina in Action pages. We have information about the upcoming public testimonies. We need your help. We need these laws to change. We need real change. We need you all to testify, and guess what? You can't make the oral testimony, write a testimony. But each voice matters. And never forget, fuck Trump. <laughs> Thank you, CJ. Next up, we have Evan from Socialist Resurgence.
Wrong side. Right side now. Uh, he hello everyone and thanks for coming out today in the rain and on such short notice. I'm Evan with Socialist Resurgence. Uh, we have a little book table at, in the corner if you all want to check it out. Can't hear you. Uh, I'm here to talk about how we need to organize against the US, NATO, and Russian war machines and all of the ways that they harm working and oppressed people. The Russian invasion of Ukraine <clears throat> marks a major turning point in great power, power rivalry, a major step towards another world war. Part of building this movement against war is pointing out the hypocrisy from the rulers as they start to whip people into support for their wars. The US government is trying to paint the Russian government as a uniquely evil state, and the Russian government is certainly evil. But they want to sweep under the rug the epidemic of police violence against black and indigenous people in this country, the ongoing attack on undocumented immigrants in this country, uh, the growing war on trans and queer people in this country, um, and on reproductive rights. Uh, the close to one million people who have died from COVID, sacrificed for profits in this country. These crises will deepen as tensions grow between all of the major powers and everywhere. Already we have seen racism against non-white refugees from Ukraine. Already we have seen asylum denied to Ukrainian refugees in Europe and in the United States. What we need to oppose these attacks is a mass movement. One that is independent of the parties of the corporations, the Democrats and the Republicans, that can mobilize people by the millions into the streets. And we've seen this before. We've seen this uh, in the opposition to the war in Vietnam. We've seen this in the opposition to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we need to rebuild this movement based on broad coalitions that can plan, that can debate politics, and that can bring whole communities into the streets and on strike and win over soldiers to oppose their own militaries. And not only do we need a mass movement, but we need a party that is also independent of the ruling class parties that can organize it and that can give it a program around not just war and not just not just this or that issue that affects um, millions and millions of people, but against capitalism as a whole and for workers' power. And um, so I just want to say again, thank you all for coming out today, and um, I'll give it back to Dan. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah. No war, no sanctions, no bombing. 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 No war in Ukraine. 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 Stop Russian missile fire and US Empire. 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 No war, no warming, another world is possible. 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 Thank you everyone for coming out today. That concludes our speakers list. If uh, we have, this is obviously an early step. This is not over, as I think everyone here has very clearly made the point. We have volunteers with clipboards that would like to get your name and email and other contact info so we can follow up with you and work with you in building a massive coalition statewide to oppose all military and intervention in the Ukraine and build an international solidarity movement that can win the soldiers who are fighting these wars to the side of the people who are the victims of these wars. Yeah. And they can end this monstrous, terrifying, insane machine that threatens all human life on Earth. So please, uh, find a volunteer, sign up, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank no you, war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. No war in Ukraine. And Russian missile fire and Rus uh, U.S. Empire. And Russian missile fire and U.S. Empire. And Russian missile fire and U.S. Empire. And Russian missile fire and U.S. Empire. No war. No warming. Another world is possible. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>